Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to our worship service today. We're very glad to have you all. Another beautiful day here. Our opening hymn on Holy Trinity Sunday is not going to be the number that you might barely see up there or the title, but it is going to be hymn number 584, O Blessed Holy Trinity, 584. service with Holy Communion. It is on page 15 in the front of the hymnal. It is also on the front wall up here in the church. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins to God our Father asking him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful, and I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment, both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ, I pray. Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. been merciful to us and has given his only son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord.
mighty God and Father, dwelling in majesty and mystery, filling and renewing all creation by your eternal <laughs> spirit, and manifesting your saving grace through our Lord Jesus Christ. In mercy, cleanse our hearts and lips that free from doubt and fear, we may ever worship you, the one true immortal God, with your Son and the Holy Spirit, living and reigning now and forever. Testament lesson for today on Trinity Sunday is recorded in Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. These are very familiar verses to us. We hear them almost every Sunday at the very conclusion of the service as the Lord blesses us. And we have the three blessings of the Lord for Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The Lord told Moses to speak to Aaron and to his sons and to tell them to bless the Israelites with these words. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious <coughs> to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. In this way they will put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Here ends our Old Testament lesson. The epistle lesson is recorded in 1 John chapter 5, Verses 5 through 12. This is also going to be the sermon text for this morning, and we will hear it again at that time. Here's what John writes. Who is the one who overcomes the world? Only the one who believes that Jesus is the Son of God. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by water alone, but by the water and by the blood. The Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. In fact, there are three that testify, the Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are one. If we accept the testimony of people, God's testimony is even greater because it is the testimony that God gave about His Son. The one who believes in the Son of God has this testimony in him, but the one who does not believe has made God out to be a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God gave about his Son. This is the testimony that God gave about his Son. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. The one who has the Son has life, and the one who does not have the Son of God does not have life. It ends our epistle lesson for this morning. Our seasonal response, Alleluia, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel is recorded in John chapter 16, verses 12 through 15. <laughs> to you, Lord. Here's what Jesus writes to tell us. I still have many things to tell you, but you cannot bear them now. But when he, the spirit of truth, comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own, but whatever he hears, he will speak. He will also declare to you what is to come. He will glorify me, because he will take from what is mine and declare it to you. Everything the Father has is mine. And this is why I said that he takes from what is mine and will declare it to you. Here ends our gospel lesson. We'll join now in the confession of our Christian faith, that is the words of the Nicene Creed. It's on pages 18 and 19 in the hymnal. We, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father. God from God, light from light, true God from truth. 
true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn. It is hymn number 195, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, the response that we just all read together. That, that response comes from Isaiah chapter 6, and we'll sing four, all four stanzas, 195. <laughs> Savior Jesus Christ. The, uh, the sermon text for today is from our epistle lesson. We're going to read a couple selected verses. This is the one who came by water and blood, Jesus Christ. He did not come by the water alone, but by the water and by the blood. 
And the Spirit is the one who testifies because the Spirit is the truth. In fact, there are three that testify. The Spirit, the water, and the blood. And these three are one. If we accept the testimony of people, God's testimony is even greater because it is the testimony that God gave about His Son. I wasn't able to make any edits or add any graphics for the uh, PowerPoint this morning. And um, I couldn't work on that, so the theme isn't correct. But at least we've got uh, the fact that this is from our epistle lesson, 1 John. And it is also, the theme is going to be focused on the Holy Trinity. And the focus is going to be the testimony of the three. The spirit, the water, and the blood. And John weaves these three together in a real special way here in his epistle that he writes. And it's at the very end of his first epistle. And the whole theme of the epistle is about the love of God. God wants us to be 100% sure that we love, that He loves us because of His Son, and that the Holy Spirit works that through us. <coughs> and now in this section, He goes on to explain, here's how this testimony comes to us as Christians so that it's something that can be reliable and that we can know that when God testifies, His testi testimony is going to be one that is strong, it is going to be true, it is going to be absolute, and it's going to be important for us to realize we trust in God's testimony. What else is reliable? What else can be more sure than what God himself says in his holy scriptures, through his word, through his son? And so today we're taking a look at the Spirit, the water, and the blood. We're going to look at that in a couple different ways, three different ways, of course. Um, in the Old Testament, the testimony was something that was established very early in the laws and commands that Moses gave. Moses told his people through God himself, we just do not accept the testimony of one human being. But we check it out. We certify it with other witnesses. And on the testimony of two or three where truth can be established, that's the testimony that we hold on to. And yet every one of us knows people lie. And sometimes they join together in all kinds of different lies to provide a false reality of what is not true, <coughs> but calling it true. Jesus experienced that when he was on trial before the Sadducees and the Pharisees, the Sanhedrin. Many, many witnesses came forward to bring their accusations against Jesus. And then the scripture tells us, but none of them agreed. And that the court was in a bit of a quandary because without agreeing witnesses, they really couldn't lawfully, they couldn't do it anyway, but they couldn't ease their conscience by saying this was a lawful act that they were doing to condemn Jesus. And so what did the high priest do? He put Jesus under oath and commanded him to testify. Are you the son of God? And Jesus' answer was correct, true, firm, right to the point. Yes, it is as you say. He is the son of God. I am the son of God. And the high priest did not take the testimony of God's very own Son, but instead 
he decided that this was a form of blasphemy and that he really needed to be put to death and they didn't need any other excuses to do that. Now they had something of his own words to use against him. Well, people who deceive God by doing things like that will find out on Judgment Day that the words that they use will be also used against them in their time of judgment and condemnation because God heard, God knows, and he knows that their testimony was false. So we focus on the true testimony that leads us to believe and to see that Jesus truly is the Son of God. And one of those very first witnesses were the angels. At the birth of Jesus, they were announcing to the shepherds and to the world that God's Son has been born. And those shepherds went to worship, those wise men came to worship, and Mary and Joseph knew that this miraculous act was one that was certain to them, their son is God's son. Now 30 years will go by, and Jesus will grow up outwardly as a normal human being, child, but the difference will be without sin. And trying to imagine a child without sin is you know, something that almost you know, blows our mind because we know what we were like as children. We know what our children are like. We know what grandchildren are like. We know what people are like. And if someone told us that, oh, that, that's, that's God's son, we'd be like, sorry, there's no way. That's a sinner, just like all of us. So when Jesus begins his ministry, the next witness comes forward, John the Baptist. And there, in the water of baptism, a baptism that was not for the washing away of sin, but a baptism that was to fulfill all of God's commands, Jesus was baptized. And God the Holy Spirit came down from heaven in the form of a dove. God, the Heavenly Father, spoke, This is my beloved Son, the Spirit, the Father, and Jesus, trying God all together, bearing testimonies that this is exactly who God has promised. And then John the Baptist will proclaim, Behold the Lamb of God takes away the sin of the world. John knew and understood why Jesus was here, and his testimony was also a part of what he was doing. As Jesus carried out his ministry, there were even more, more witnesses who gave proof that Jesus was truly God. Some of those witnesses will be miracles. And the people who saw a miracle happen right in front of them and know that this was not something that a human being could do. But this was something that God has done. And as they saw those miracles, experienced those miracles, they spoke about those miracles, they shared the news about those miracles, they gave testimony that what they saw was true. And they wanted to share it in all the world. And the disciples wrote these miracles down so that we also could know and believe that everything that Jesus did was very important proof and truth of exactly who Jesus is. Now one of the ways in which we can also look at the spirit, the water, and the blood is to look at this as um, the beginning of of Jesus as he not only started his ministry but as he fulfilled that ministry on the cross. Here was another one of the proofs that was stated to number one, let us know for sure Jesus died. The spear was plunged into his side so that the soldier could make sure that he knew for sure whether or not Jesus was dead or alive. 
and the water and the blood had already separated inside his body and that is what came out and that was a proof to this soldier and to all of his disciples. Death had taken place and the body was already beginning to uh, show its human characteristics of breaking down. And so Jesus was dead. He was buried. But then again, he came back from the dead and he gave witness of that through his resurrection and the Holy Spirit gave that message to his disciples so that they would all know that, would see that, and would be 100% confident that the very same one who died is the very same one who came back to life. Look at my hands, look at my feet, look at my side, and see that it is truly me, and that you're not being fooled by something else. Uh, many early Christian teachings were already beginning to have some questions about how could Jesus really be both true God and true man in one person? Maybe it was just the man Jesus that died and the God Jesus that rose again from the dead. But as John points us to the connection of all these things go together, he wants to reassure all Christians that it is true God and true man in one person. Uh, we take a, a longer look at that in the Nicene Creed at our communion services. And one of these years when we have a nice, beautiful, cool Sunday morning where there is not communion, we'll do the Athanasian Creed, a two-pager, 132, 133 in the hymnal. It takes a while. It's detailed. And it's there to let us know God knows what he's talking about. And he really goes to great lengths to try to explain it to human minds how it is that Three are one, one are three, and each are separate, and all are a part of God. The Old Testament scriptures were fulfilled throughout Christ's ministry. They talked about the shedding of his blood, and that was fulfilled. They talked about him being raised again from the dead, with a new giving life and a new giving spirit that he wants to share with all. And God continues to do that through the sacraments, through the water, through the blood, the bread, and the blood, the body, and the wine. All of these are there to reassure us time and time again that death happened, death had a purpose, and that's part of the testimony that what God wants to give to us. Now another testimony, as I mentioned, is certainly going to be the, the sacraments. The sacraments also come toward the very end of Jesus' ministry, Maundy Thursday, Holy Communion. And Jesus is specifically talking about bread and wine. This is my body, this is my blood. And so as John talks about this, Blood, it is that reminder for us that that blood was shed for a reason and for a purpose. And then 40 days later, day of ascension, Jesus established sacrament number two, holy baptism. And there through the water, connected with the word, through the work of the Holy Spirit, God adopts us into his family and makes us a part of his kingdom. And he makes his testimony personal. We weren't there to hear Jesus' father speak. This is my son. We weren't there at his baptism. We weren't there at his uh, revelation on the Mount of Transfiguration. We weren't there for those things. We take them by faith. But baptism and communion are means of grace that are touchable that are relatable. As I baptize children, babies, adults, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And a name is mentioned as that baptism takes place. This is your personal baptism. Your sins 
are washed away. My sins were washed away in holy baptism. We don't sit in the back and say, oh, I got splashed. Maybe my sins were washed away too, but it's the individual for whom the baptism is performed. It is personal. It is tangible. And in Holy Communion, he's reminding us time and time again, for you, for you, for the forgiveness of sins, for the remission of sins, this is for you. Take and eat. These blessings are for you. Your sins are forgiven through what Jesus promises in these sacraments with the water and the blood and the Spirit working that faith in our hearts to trust and believe that all that God has done for us is something that we personally can have. As we read the scriptures, we can get that very same message. But sometimes you wonder, are these verses for me? Uh, are you, am I sure that I'm the one that can be Forgiven? Am I part of that world that God loves so much He gave His only Son? It, it can lead some questions. And yet we always want to go back to God's Word and reassure people through the Word. It's positive. It's real. And with baptism and communion, it solidifies it even more for us in a very special way. Another way that these verses can be talked about, the water the blood and the spirit, we'll be talking about the ministry of Jesus Christ. When he was anointed by the Holy Spirit as that baptism was taking place in those waters, the Holy Spirit was connecting the water and himself and God's word and he was getting Jesus ready to carry out his ministry and Jesus would continue to do that and at the very end of his public ministry, as he was put to death, the disciples saw that that blood was shed. And then three days later, they saw that their, their Savior was still alive. And that's the testimony that they wanted to share. And over 500 witnesses, eyewitnesses, saw that reality and testimony and they knew that they were not deceived. They believed in the Son of God. And by believing in the Son of God, they had the testimony that God wanted them to know. And they weren't calling out God to be a liar. That Jesus really wasn't raised from the dead, that he really wasn't the Savior. They believed everything about Jesus because that's what the scriptures had told them. That's what all the testimony had brought about to them as well. In our lives, we still give a lot of importance to testimony. And that is a huge part of our judicial system. That we are trying to find out the truth. And sometimes you cannot find that truth out just by asking. What do you think is the truth? What do you think is the truth? Because you can get a million different things that people think. But ultimately, you've got to figure out on the basis of what happened. How did it happen? Who saw what happened? And established that these objective facts that witnesses have seen and brought together bring us to this unmistakable conclusion. The witnesses are true. The testimony is true. Uh, there, there's some people that you know in this world that we would never believe a word that comes out of their mouths just because we know that they are not very reliable. And there's others that will take a lot more stock in what they say because we've known how they've lived their lives. But no human being is 100% reliable. And so we as Christians always go back to the word time and time and time again. And that's part of what John wants us to re be reminding us about. In the word, the water, the blood, and the spirit are all a part of those testimonies. Along with God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, 
the testimony of the scriptures in the Old Testament leading up to Jesus, the testimony of the scriptures by the apostles that said, here's what happened. Here's what we saw. And what a blessed thing it is to know we're standing on what is most firm, God's word. Amen. The peace of God that passes all understanding to your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. This morning in our prayers, we remember Nancy Beckendorf, who is on hospice care. Uh, she's back at her apartment. Uh, we ask that the Lord would continue to be with her. Um, I've heard throughout the week that we have members from our church that caught COVID over the last two weeks and are continuing that process of recovery. And we pray that God would be with them in that process as well. And our first prayer is on behalf of Refuge Evangelical Lutheran Church, Durham, North Carolina. Jesus, our loving shepherd, we pray that you continue to gather your people in the Durham, North Carolina area to be nurtured by your good news and word and sacraments in the new home mission called Refuge Lutheran Church. Bless Pastor Doug Lang and the core group as they connect with the people you put into their lives. Give them hearts like yours to listen and emphasize, to offer hope and to pray as they hear about people's struggles. We also ask, Lord, that throughout the Synod's 100 Mission in 10 Years campaign, many more home mission churches may be started across North America to bring more souls to heaven through your saving message. May your kingdom come, dear Father in heaven. Amen. We also offer prayers on behalf of those who are sick that God would watch over. Compassionate Father, in your mercy, you transform even sickness and disease into blessings for your children. 
With this confidence, we commit all who are sick or suffering to your tender care. We pray especially for Nancy Beckendorf on hospice care and for all of our members who are dealing with COVID. Provide healing and relief according to your infinite wisdom and boundless mercy. Grant them patient endurance if this must linger and help them find true spiritual strength through Jesus and his cross during this time of physical weakness. By the work of the Holy Spirit, church, teach all of us to trust in your forgiveness, grace, and love. Triune God, you are the one eternal God whose name we praise forever. We could have not known you, our only Savior, if you had not revealed yourself to us as Father, Son, and Spirit, three persons, yet one God. Remove from us all unbelief and grant us humble faith as we contemplate this high and holy mystery. Scatter all those who are wise in their own counsels and give us a simple childlike trust to worship you in unity, the Trinity in unity, and the unity in Trinity. O Holy Spirit, you are the God of glory, the God of grace, the God of every comfort. From you and through you and to you are all things. We rejoice to call you Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and to so praise your holy name forever. Amen. We also join in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is good and right so to do. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who on this day of Pentecost kept your promise and poured out the Holy Spirit to empower his church to proclaim the gospel in all the world. And as we celebrate Holy Trinity today, we confess with you that your Son and Holy Spirit are one God and one Lord, and we acknowledge you as Creator, Redeemer, and Sanctifier. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song.